Hi, and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Rebecca Gifford and I'm your moderator for today's webinar. I'm a writer and workshop facilitator. I also co-host the podcast When Life Gives You Parkinson's with my husband, Larry Gifford, who occasionally moderates these webinars. He was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's disease in 2017. So today we are going to discuss life with Parkinson's from a loved one's perspective. Our panelists will share their experiences and tips and answer your questions. They will also talk about what being a care partner can look like and whether there's a more preferred description for those who care for a loved one with Parkinson's. We'll also discuss how to recognize stress and burnout and strategies to prevent it. If you have a question, you can type it in the Q&A box near the middle of the screen. And foundation staff and our panelists will get to as many as we can. And if you want other helpful information, check the resource list on your screen. We'll be mentioning that several times during the webinar. So this is a big topic, a lot to cover, and we would really love to get started. We're excited to talk with all of you. So let me introduce our panelists. First, we have Rich Sussman from New Jersey. His wife, Pola, was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2017. Welcome, Rich. Good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> we have uh, Dr. Jory Fleischer, who is a movement disorder specialist and associate professor at the Department of Neurological Sciences at Rush Medical College in Illinois. She has several research studies underway focused on caregivers. It's exciting. Welcome, Good Dr. Morning, Fleischer. Everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity to join you. And we have Maggie Roland Wartendyke from Tennessee. Her dad, Mike, was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2014. Welcome, Maggie. Hey. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thank you, everybody, for being willing to share your experiences and wisdom today. Let's get started. So Michael J. Fox has a wonderful quote that says, when I first heard about my diagnosis, I was so angry. And Tracy just looked at me and said simply, in sickness and in health. As care partners and loved ones, we know in a way we also are diagnosed with Parkinson's. So I'd love to start with Rich. When your wife, Pola, was diagnosed with Parkinson's, what was your initial reaction and how has your care partner experience evolved over time? Wow. Um, my initial reaction was, I don't know, it was a combination of being scared, being afraid, uh, being upset. The, the, the background was that the closest experience I had to Parkinson's prior to that was from Paula's dad, my father-in-law. Uh, he was diagnosed uh, late in life. So the first thing I'm thinking is, no, Paul is much too young to have Parkinson's. That's not right. Um, the second thing I'm thinking is that he, he quite frankly, didn't do very well with his, like, with his disease. It progressed very rapidly, you know, taking his body, taking his mind. So I, I confess, you know, one, that I was thinking terrible things about what this actually meant. And, and the second thing was, I wasn't actually sharing that with anyone. I wasn't going to actually say, oh, my gosh, you know, is it going to be the same as, as my father-in-law? Um, so that, that was my initial reaction, not, not necessarily the best reaction. Um, subsequent to that, you asked about kind of the journey. So, you know, I discovered that, A, I was wrong. People with Parkinson's, they all have unique experiences, and most people can do quite well and accomplish a lot for, you know, a long period of time. So that was wrong. I learned that there's lots of resources to help me and help Paul along the journey. So that's that's really important. Um, I think I learned and am still learning how to be a good care partner. And and I think very importantly, I learned to focus on the positives and, and focus on today. So, for example, while it's true that Paula has trouble with dyskinesia, and there are points during the day where walking might be difficult, or parts of the day where standing might be difficult. She still manages every morning to do her, her stretches, 
we still go and we take the dog, best puppy ever, for about a mile long walk every morning and afternoon. And she does between an hour and two hours of exercise each day, which has been really important. So I focus on that. I focus on all the positives. I focus on how well she's doing, you know, as opposed to focusing on some of the other aspects of it. So that's, I, th I think that's been really important to, to me and, and to Paula. Yeah, and kind of taking control of what you can, can take control of, right? Yeah, exactly. so the exercise and the things that, and the research and the things that you can do. Yeah, I like that. And our, our, um, our journeys are, are constantly evolving because the disease is always progressing. Right, so we have to, we're kind of in that constant state of, of evolution. <laughs> yes, right? yes, and, and and one thing that that Paula says and, and truly believes, and this is another reason for kind of living in the moment, is that if the disease did not progress any further, she'd be perfectly happy with where she was today. Well, if she's perfectly happy with where she was today, then you know that's great. That's a good. That's a good starting point. That's much better to be, you know, focusing on that. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that perspective, Rich. Maggie, I want to ask you a question. We often refer to people who care for loved ones with Parkinson's as care partners. How do you feel about this? Do you feel there is a more preferred term for someone like yourself who isn't a person or isn't a partner of a person with Parkinson's, but is certainly affected by Parkinson's? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I actually was intimidated to take part in this webinar when we talked about care partners. That's not really how I see myself. Um, I think the name of the webinar is perfect. Like, do you love someone who has Parkinson's? I do, like a whole lot. So um, I think that that, to me, it's just as simple as that. I don't need a label or anything like that. Um, I, but again, I care for my dad in a different way. So a care partner doesn't really isn't really applicable to me. Do you have a term that you would rather use, or is it just my dad has Parkinson's? <laughs> yeah, be that simple. I don't think that's complicated. Right. Rich, I'd love to get your take on that. Is it, Are you comfortable with care partner? How do you respond to caregiver? Yeah, I, I'm not uncomfortable with care partner. Uh, it's probably not my preferred term. Um, much to Polish chagrin, we've been married for 40 years, and at after that period of time, we're, we're, we're life partners, so we take care of each other. So when I hear care partner, it sounds like it's a very one-sided relationship, and, and I don't think that's right. So the phrase that I like, which I can't take credit for, <laughs> that you and I can take credit for, is partners in Parkinson's. And, and I view Paul and I as being partners. I view her movement specialist as being with us as partners. I view the, the Fox Foundation with us as partners, our kids, friends, you know, it's just, you know, it's a whole community. So that's what I like. Yeah. Well, and I have to, to be honest, we can't take credit for it either. Larry and I have a partner in Parkinson's that came from uh, Cheryl Haig, our friend Cheryl Haig, the wife of Tim Haig. And she, she coined that. And so we co-opted it and use it in the podcast all the time. But you're right, it's perfect, right? Because um, at least most of the time, because it's we're all kind of partnering in this, we're all involved in this, and everybody, um, at least the intention is for everybody to have an equal say in in how it goes and in the care of this person. We're all involved in the care of this person we love, right? Exactly. Yeah, great. So, Dr. Fleischer, uh, what advice do you have for people who love someone with Parkinson's but aren't sure how to support them? It's such a great question. And um, I think the best thing to do is ask the person with Parkinson's what they can do to be helpful. Um, I think so many times, sorry for any subway noise, um, so many times, you know, we, we jump and think, I, I'm going to send an article, I'm going to do this, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to send something. And it's really so person dependent, right, on what is helpful and what's helpful in that moment, right? You know, an article might be wanted a month after a diagnosis or, you know, two months after a hospitalization or, you know, something, but maybe right in that moment, that's not what that person needs. So I think rather than assume and rather than act from a place of here's what I think I might want in this situation where we can really never know what that's like until we, you know, walk in, in that person's shoes, just ask what would be most helpful. 
um, and coming to it, you know, sometimes I hear from a lot of partners and Parkinson's, a lot of families that say, you know, my loved one doesn't want to talk about it. You know, they don't want anything and respecting that. Um, and sometimes a great way to be helpful is to say, to put it back on you um, and say, you know, I would really like to feel helpful. I would really like, you know, it would make me feel good to be able to do something for you. What might that be like? Um, you yeah. know, and then it gives, it, you know, it shifts the conversation a little bit. Yeah, it focuses on their needs, but also allows them to acknowledge that you're just trying to just trying to help. So keeping those communication lines open. And I think it gets to, to Rich's point that this caregiver feels very one sided. But yeah. if you can have the person with Parkinson's in the giving seat to say, let me give you something to do as right. someone who wants to help, that can be helpful. That's great. So we have an audience question that um, maybe Maggie, you'd like to take a stab at this. Um, my mom has Parkinson's, but I live far away. How can I best support her from afar? Because you don't live in the same place as your father, correct? I don't. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, which is where my parents currently live. So not super far away. We're, I'm a quick drive, but not in the same town. So um, this is a constant struggle. So um, I feel for this person who asked this question. Um, it changes, I would say. Uh, along your journey with Parkinson's, we always talk about how it, it changes and grows and evolves as your loved one changes and grows and evolves. So um, at the very beginning, you, we talked about communication. Uh, we didn't talk about it at all. So supporting from afar was pretty difficult, or I guess you could say it was easy because we just continued it about normal life. Um, as we've been a couple years out from diagnosis, we are you know, more able to talk about it. So for me, I would say, just like Dr. Fleischer said, um, figuring out how your loved one, that how does mom want to talk about it? Does she want to talk about it? Um, does she want to ignore that it's happening? Maybe not the, best, the healthiest option, but follow, I would say follow mom's lead. Um, make sure that you're asking the uh, how are doctor's appointments? When is your next one? Um, do you have any uh, things that you're worried about? Have you noticed anything changing? Um, sometimes just an ear uh, for somebody to listen who's um, not involved in the everyday life and can have a bit of a different perspective, I found that that, to me, is the best way to try and support. Well, and it can be tough, too, because you're trying to support and help them where they need help, but they you also don't want to encroach upon their independence. You want them to feel like we support them doing as much as they can do for as long as they can do, right? So you're always kind of walking a fine a fine line there. And so, yeah, so keeping, like you and Dr. Fleischer both said, keeping that communication open and just kind of keep keep having that conversation. Yeah, I yeah. like that. Absolutely. Great. So I just want to remind our viewers that there is a guide called You, Your Loved Ones, and Parkinson's Disease, and there's a link to that in the resource list if you want to read more about that. Okay, so let's move on to talking a bit about something um, that is a sometimes a daunting process, managing the care of a person with Parkinson's or helping to manage the care of a person with Parkinson's. Now, we know everyone is different and every relationship is different, but there are some tips that seem to come up pretty consistently as helpful tools or things to keep in mind regarding this. For example, from the list on the slide, <clears throat> get help, build a good um, care team. And part of that is if you can see, consult a movement disorder specialist. Be organized, keep lists and prepare ahead for appointments. That's a big one for Larry and myself. Um, we, we always have a meeting before the meeting and kind of get our get a list together, make sure that we're remembering all the things that happened since the last time we saw them, make sure that we're able to get addressed all the things that we need to, because it's, sometimes it's a pretty long list. And then stay informed as much as you're comfortable. And there's more, there's a longer list on the slide there. But Dr. Fleischer, uh, care partners can be invaluable resources, I believe, when it comes to getting information and perspective on how the person with Parkinson's is doing. What tips do you have for care partners and how they can best manage the relationship with the care team and then participate in the care team? It's such a great question. Um, and this really comes up every day. So I love your idea of the meeting before the meeting, right? Strategizing, you know, 
we're going to have this appointment, and whether the appointment is half an hour or whatever it is, having that prioritized list um, coming into the visit with that is so powerful um, and can help you get the most out of the visit. I also think a really important thing to talk about in that pre-meeting is, you know, because Parkinson's can be so insidious, it can be so sneaky, and some symptoms might not be noticeable to the person with Parkinson's, but care you know, partners and family members might notice things. It's a good time in that pre-meeting to maybe say, you know, would it be okay? I, I've noticed that your leg is dragging when you're walking, or I've noticed that your handwriting is changing a little bit. Have you noticed that? Would it be okay for me to bring that up at the visit? Um, because sometimes, you know, sometimes it can be really difficult if care partner is bringing something up for the very first time um, in the doctor's <sighs> visit. You know, I can sense that tension of why did you say that? You know, what's going on? Um, so I think if you can, if there are symptoms that you're concerned about and you're worried, um, broaching that, you know, with the loved one first is great. If not, um, you know, many many healthcare systems are on, you know, an electronic health portal, whether it's a my chart or something else. Um, and you can always, you know, send a message. Um, if you have access to your loved one's chart, if you're a proxy, um, you know, you could send a message, you could call and, and leave a message with the nurse just to say, here's something I'm concerned about. You know, I wanted to give you a heads up. If you don't feel comfortable and you'd like the provider to bring that up first, that's something that I have a lot of family members who do. Yeah, so you've got, so you're kind of helping to um, keep the communication open when the person with Parkinson's may may not be inclined to or may, um, or may be having an off day or something like that. You're, you're kind of assisting in that process. Exactly. Okay, great. Um, Maggie, you are an adult child of a person with Parkinson's. How do you participate in your father's care? Uh, well, Dr. Fleischler actually sent a message that said many MDs are thrilled to have family members join visits by phone, which Great. yeah, I know that. <laughs> start, to, uh, start, start demanding some phone calls. Um, I would say an adult child specifically who lives uh, in a different city, um, being a part of the care uh, is, and I hate the word care because my father requires no care. Um, being a part of the care is... Um, it's a little more difficult. So for me, what that means is um, after each appointment or before or, you know, a couple of days later, I always try to get on the phone um, with that and just get a full download of what did you guys talk about? Um, you know, did you have to do this? Did you have to do the walk test? Did you have to do this? You know, how did it go? Anything new? What are they talking about in the future? Um, did you ask them about that thing that we talked about? Uh, and then yeah. it also includes talking to my mom and getting the same download from her because she um, and then sometimes with half of the picture from both of them, I can get a full picture of uh, what went on at the doctor's appointment. So uh, it's just trying to be involved as much as you can and just understanding what everyone, what page everyone is on. Right. Do you have conversations with your parents about how you might be helpful in that process? Um, I think rather than having conversations with them about how I can be helpful, I typically just butt my way in <laughs> and force myself into being helpful. Um, I think that communication is important in every family or every friendship of someone who um, has Parkinson's. And you kind of have to learn what works for you. So, um, you know, I works for me and dad to catch up every Friday. And uh, sometimes we talk about Parkinson's and sometimes we don't mention it at all. So um, understanding kind of by uh, body language and whether or not uh, anyone's willing to talk about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I try not to push too hard if I don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Has communication changed over time with your, with your father? And I'd love to ask Rich about that as well. Has communication shifted at all over time with um, as your, your father or your wife's uh, Parkinson's progresses? Yeah, sure. Um, I can take that one. Um, it has definitely changed. So I kind of alluded to in the beginning, right when um, dad was diagnosed, we didn't talk about it at all. It was a really strange elephant in the room, kind of pretended that uh, no one no one had Parkinson's. And now it's kind of a part of our daily life. And um, 
I'm kind of a jokester, so I tried to make some jokes um, in the beginning that uh, did not land. And I think we've finally gotten to the point where we can all kind of um, laugh and joke a little bit when, when appropriate. So uh, it's definitely a spectrum from not talking about it at all to it's here and we're going to talk about it and kind of name it. Right. I, we have an audience question, and I'm going to pose this to Rich. How do you separate spouse and caregiver if one has Parkinson's and the other has a medical condition? Or maybe that's a better question for Dr. Dr. Fleischer. Or if anybody wants to chime in. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not totally sure if I under. Okay, go ahead, Rich. The question is, how do you separate spouse and caregiver? And I guess I guess that's the crux of the question. It looks like the asker has um, the one one of the the um, spouses has Parkinson's and the other has a medical condition, so they're kind of in the process of trying to negotiate caregiver versus care partner and and how does that work? And maybe this is a question for Rich for how do you negotiate um, how you work together in managing the Parkinson's, but then like how your relationship perhaps has shifted since the Parkinson's joined the family. Yeah, I, I'm not uh, the, the perfect example here because um, I don't have a, a medical condition that can compare with, with Parkinson's. Um, so that, um, that, that makes it difficult for me to put myself in, in their shoes. But I, I would say that um, um, Dr. Fleischer said something early I think was really important, which is that you ask the person, what can you do to be helpful? In, in Paula's case, what she finds helpful um, is something kind of comparable to what Maggie said, which is not to dwell on the Parkinson's. You know, she doesn't want to she doesn't want to be reminded about the Parkinson's all the time. Um, she doesn't want to have to think about all the the what ifs and what might happen in the future. So she asked me to be incredibly supportive, to be with her with at, at all the doctor's appointments to be as knowledgeable as I can, that I can help out in, in that way, um, and to, um, um, and to in, in, in general, um, try to, to encourage her by pointing out reasons for optimism. Uh, yeah. For instance, she, her exercise that she does, there's no question whatsoever in our mind that it's helped to slow the, the progression. She's been doing really well with it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna emphasize that for example. So that's that's kind of our strategy. Yeah. Have you and Paula had conversations um, about important decisions for the future? You're talking about being in the present, but have you had kind of those tough conversations about the future as well? Um, we, we very briefly had <sighs> those kind of discussions. Uh, again, it's not something we were going to be discussing a lot. Um, Paula's dad that I mentioned had Parkinson's. And for the last um, three years of his life, he was essentially bedridden and on hospice care. He stayed in his house. Uh, my dad had vascular dementia. And for the last 18 months of, of his life, he was in a memory care unit. And, and Paula very quickly said, OK, let's get this settled right now. And then let's, let's not even talk about it after this. We're gonna, I'm going to stay in the home. Maybe I'm see you. You're going to stay in the home. We're going to stay in our home. You know, I don't want to go into one of those facilities. That's just the way it is. So we did have a discussion, um, and it, it's it, it's done now. It's 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 decided, and that's what we're going to do. And we, we don't we don't bring it up anymore, except for but how great is that that you right? Yeah, you you got the tough conversation out of the way, and so now you know what the plan is, and you can focus on the present. Exactly. Yeah. Great, I think that's wonderful. Okay, so now we'd like to take a short station break. <laughs> to, I wanna tell you about uh, the foundation's landmark study, PPMI. Right now it is recruiting um, the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative, also known as PPMI, is the study that could change everything about how Parkinson's is diagnosed, managed, and treated. And right now, the study needs parents, siblings, and adult children of people with Parkinson's. You can take a short survey and get started by clicking Get Started in the Take Action box on your screen.
The study is also recruiting people diagnosed with Parkinson's in the last two years who are not yet taking PD medications. You can learn more about PPMI by clicking on the link in the resource list. Rich, I believe you are a PPMI participant, am I right? Well, I have volunteered to be a control person. I've not been onboarded yet, but I've been promised that I'll be control subject number one at the hospital where Paula's movement specialist is. Right. And so why did you sign up? Um, uh, just a, a little bit of, of uh, background, uh, which is that um, um, Paula has a mutation that is linked to Parkinson's. One of the mutations that the PPM, PPMI study is is um, looking to study more. Um, when Paula's mutation was found, um, I did sign up for genetic screening. I was, and it sounds a little weird, but I was kind of hoping to be found with a mutation that I could participate in research um, because, you know, as, as a care partner, as a partner in, in participants, uh, a partner in Parkinson's, <laughs> we might have to fix that one. I trouble getting that one out. Um, right. you know, it's one thing just to kind of be on the, the sidelines and, and a cheerleader and helping, but you know, I want to try and see if there's something that I can do to, to, to actually be involved and help. And we have participated in research studies. Um, Paula is the active participant and I'm kind of a control. Um, we do Fox Insight. And I signed up for PPMI for the, for the same reason, because, um, you know, if, if I can somehow contribute to it, um, it helps Paula, it helps everyone else, you know, it helps our kids who might have the same mutation. So why not yeah. do it? Great. I know it's just what can we do, right? There's no cure, but we can do so much to try to move things along and, and organizations like the foundation rely upon people to yeah, participate. I podcast, but it's probably not, not my thing. <laughs> All right. Thanks for telling us about that. So let's move on to talk a little about stress and burnout. Exciting. The world right now is dealing with an increased level of stress. My goodness. Not to mention raised levels of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion. And for anyone caring for a loved one with Parkinson's or any disease on for that matter, the potential for burnout is very real. Dr. Fleischer, what are some of the symptoms of burnout that we can be looking for to recognize in ourselves and our loved ones? I'm so glad we're talking about this topic. So, you know, anger, frustration with the loved one, increased anger, frustration just in general, um, you know, feeling like you're detaching more from your, you know, caring from just the relationship with that person, these can all be signs of burnout, um, as well as, you know, physical exhaustion, emotional exhaustion, feeling like your fuse is so much shorter. Um, you know, and I think we are, we're in a burnout pandemic um, that goes, you know, that is not unrelated um, to the, the main pandemic that's going on. So I think it's so critical to recognize and to know that there are things that we can do about it. Well, what are some of those things? that people can, if they start to recognize um, the sign, what's a way to get started in taking care of yourself and, and um, moving through that? So, I mean, I think number one is recognizing that, you know, that, that you might be going through burnout and knowing that that is normal, that that is okay, um, and that this work, dealing with this disease is hard. Um, you know, when I, when I tell someone, when I give someone a diagnosis of Parkinson's, I tell them, you know, this, this doesn't define you, but this doesn't just affect you. This affects your family. This affects your circle, right? So, you know, recognizing that this is hard and it's okay to ask for help. It's okay. And it is critical to take a break. Um, you know, someone um, posted earlier, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup, right? There are all these analogies, you know, the, the flight attendants on, on flights when we all used to fly said, you know, put the oxygen mask on yourself first before helping someone else. You have to find ways if you're feeling burnout to recharge in some way. And that may be as simple as, you know, being in the moment and just taking a breath and going, that's not how I wanted to respond to that request, or that's not the way 
that I would have phrased this if I had some more sleep. Let me take a breath. Let me just go take a lap around the dining room. Let me go pet the dog or call a friend, even if it's for, you know, two seconds. Let me look at some stupid memes. You know, let me, let me do something. <laughs> and then trying to find ways. I mean, I'm not knocking stupid memes. They get me through Sunday nights. Um, you know, but, <laughs> but finding ways to really recognize the burnout in yourself, normalize that, and then take some kind of action. And it's not like you're going to say, man, you know, I feel burnt out today. Well, I'm just going to meditate and do some yoga and then it's all going to go away. No one, no one thinks that, and that's not realistic, but recognizing it and starting to take steps of what is, what is self-care for you as the partner, you know, in Parkinson's or as the person with Parkinson's who's feeling that burnout, what is meaningful to you? If that's yoga, if that's having a piece of chocolate, if that's, you know, going for a walk or petting the dog, whatever that is, being able to try to, to work that in, you know, on a daily basis, on a regular basis, um, to know that you have that break is really critical. Well, and I love that you acknowledge the fact that no one is perfect and that we can't expect ourselves to be superwoman, superman, and do everything, take care of ourselves, take care of the person with Parkinson's, take care of the world, and still be able to be super with it and balanced all the time. And, um, and that it's something as simple as stopping to take a breath or go to a different room or walk around the block can really help to break that stress cycle. And I would, I mean, I would push back on that a little bit just to say, if you're here today, if you're listening to this, if you're identifying as a partner in Parkinson's, you're already a superman, superwoman, super non-binary, you know, you're, you're there already. You've already taken those steps to get connected and to learn and to be empowered. You're already doing it. Give yourself the credit that you deserve. Great. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Thank you. Rich, what advice or tips do you have for people on how to move through the challenges and sometimes the surprises that arise um, related to to um, Pola? So we know that with the in unpredictability of, of Parkinson's, sometimes our days can change really quickly. Do you have any tips or strategies for how you kind of move through that? Well, um, first of all, I have to say that Pola is, is doing pretty well that she makes a concerted effort to take care of herself, whether it's through exercise, diet, maintaining social relationships, and, and keeping a positive outlook. So all that is, is important. But in terms of, of how to, to cope with things, um, I think Dr. Fleischer mentioned the dog. We do have a, a great puppy. That's always, uh, always something that's important. Um, but I think it's really important to, A, be knowledgeable what Parkinson's is. So, you know, some people who have not been exposed or just think about the tremors. But as an example, I don't think Paul would mind my saying this, one of her major issues is anxiety. And Parkinson's related anxiety is one of those things where you can't do a lot with it. You now, sometimes there's some drugs that may or may not help. But just recognizing that the anxiety is from the Parkinson's and recognizing that there's not a lot you can do about it helps because you don't have a discussion like, well, what are you anxious? There's no reason to be anxious. Oh, I know why you're anxious. It's because you have Parkinson's, you know, and the fact that we both can recognize that I think helps. The other thing that I, I, I that I find very helpful is if, um, if you get to one of those periods where it's like, ah, oh, this Parkinson's is really, this is a really, a, you know, bad thing. I go and I, take a look to see what I can find that is, is positive that's going on. What new research is out there? If there was a, a previous webinar that was given that was really optimistic and positive, I might even rewatch that. So I just, I just look for, for ways for kind of recharging the batteries to make myself more positive and give all the more reasons for optimism. So that, that's kind of my go-to strategy. So there's so much information out there, right? And so many reasons to be optimistic, yeah. That's a great, I love that tool. Yeah. Yeah. Maggie, we have a question from the audience. Uh, this person asks, how can I help my father go through his experience with Parkinson's and also help my mom cope? You're kind of doing this from afar. So how do you participate in that? Yeah. So um, I've kind of already talked a lot about um, just an open line of communication. Um, 
specifically with mom, we talk every day. So again, we don't always talk about Parkinson's, but it's nice to have a check in and figure out how she's doing, how she's feeling. Um, the one of the ways that my family and I and our friends ourselves into this is to find um, something tangible that we can do to help, which for us, that manifests in fundraising for the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Uh, we are part of Team Fox, the grassroots effort to raise money for the foundation. So we host events and it's a tangible way that we can feel like we are doing something. So and you can see the dollars tick up so you can see exactly how much impact you've had. So it's been really great for us to have an outlet and something that we can do where we're feeling like we're helping. We're not sitting back and like letting it happen to us. We are moving forward and, and making change. Um, but as that relates to burnout, you know, I'm not a physical care partner. So burnout for me is a, is a little different. Um, every year we host a big event and we try to raise a lot of money and it's fun and we shake pom-poms and we wear fox masks and everything is orange and everything is blue. And it's a really good time and it's a really great way for our community to rally around us. But sometimes, usually about once a year, I get into a bit of a funk and say, I don't want to shake pom-poms and talk about how exciting parking is. <laughs> it's not exciting, it really stinks. Um, so I kind of get into a spot where I'm really not interested in um, being joyful about Parkinson's. So I just have to let myself feel that. Um, it's not one of those things that you can like push through because then it gets worse. So I think every once in a while, if you're in a situation like I am where you're not like a physical care partner, but you're trying to support in other ways, sometimes it's, it's fine to just step back and say, okay, for a week or a day or however long, I'm gonna not think about it. I'm not gonna send out fundraising emails. I'm not gonna, you know, secure water for the water stations just going to live my life and kind of put it to the back of my brain. That might not be the healthiest option, but for me it is. Um, and then you're more refreshed and able to jump back in um, full force um, once you've kind of breathed through it. Right. You're allowing yourself to kind of feel feelings that come up, right? So yeah, that you can move through them and get back to that place of enthusiasm and support. And, right. Yeah. Just give yourself some grace. Right. Oh, I like that. Give yourself some grace. I'm going to use that. So it's important to note that many care partners and caregivers also are experiencing financial challenges. And I bring this up because Congress is considering a bill that would provide financial relief to caregivers. The foundation's policy team is advocating for this. And you can learn more about it by clicking on the resourceless link. OK. <clears throat> um, Dr. Fleischer, the foundation often gets questions about the challenges of supporting a loved one with cognitive and memory changes, which certainly can add to a care partner or a loved one's stress level. Um, what advice can you offer regarding that? So, um, you know, I think Rich said it really well is to get information, you know, to, to be empowered, to get the knowledge to know you know, what might come up and what you're dealing with so that you can understand it. Because some of the symptoms, you know, like anxiety, right? The anxiety might seem like it's a response to something else going on, but it's actually part of the Parkinson's. Um, one of the things that I think becomes this sort of elephant in the room and a real source of frustration is apathy. So a person living with Parkinson's just kind of loses their motivation. I mean, I think about like motivation as a gas tank and it's like someone kind of poked a hole and they know they should exercise and their family is, you know, telling them they got to exercise, they got to do the things. And they just, you know, not today, but maybe tomorrow, right? And it can become this source of frustration and not recognizing that that's the disease talking, you know, rather than that person. So I think understanding things like apathy, understanding the ways in which memory and thinking can change in Parkinson's, not in everyone, but the things that can be affected and the things that, that don't tend to change. Um, one thing that often comes up, and, and my bias is that I'm, my clinical focus is more in advanced um, stage PD, and so this does not apply to everyone. But sometimes people can have hallucinations or they can have delusions. Um, you know, they, they might be paranoid that someone is plotting against them or family is doing something behind their back. And no matter what, as tempting as it is to try to prove them wrong, you can't, you can't fight it. Um, you can't argue 
with the brain kind of firing on a faulty pattern. So what I tell my you know care partners and family members who are so frustrated by this is you have to let them be in their reality and either you can join them. So, you know, if someone is saying, you know, here's what's going on, you know, whatever that is, tell me more about that. Instead of saying, you know, no, no one's here. That didn't happen. Yeah. What was that like? What do you think? You know, what do you think they're thinking about? What do you think they're doing? Be with them in that reality. And then they see you as a partner or, you know, distract, redirect, right? So if someone is really fixated on, on something, recognizing you're not going to convince them out of it. Um, but for example, you know, I have patients sometimes where they might, you know, they might see a dog in the room. They're not upset by it, but they keep asking about the dog. And I have great care partners who'll say, oh, you know what? That dog is leaving in about five minutes. You want to go in the kitchen? And then when we come back, I know the dog will be gone. And things like that really show the partnership um, and it, it seems like they help that person in, in these, you know, experiences with patients. Patients feel heard. Um, it does not make them feel, you know, like they have a disease. They feel like they have a family member who is listening to them, respecting their reality and helping them get past it. Um, so understand those symptoms and sort of work with them rather than trying to fight against them. Great. Thank you so much for that. We should note that there is a new guide on thinking and memory in the resource list that should be on your screen there. Also a great online resource is the Parkinson's Buddy Network. Um, there's a group for caregivers and care partners in that. You can also find that linked on the resource list. So there, <clears throat> there are lots of uh, resources and, and help available for you should you feel confused by any of the things that we're, that we're talking about here. Well, it is time for Q&A. We have been receiving a lot of great questions. And as a reminder, please enter any questions you may have in the Q&A box, and we will get to as many as we can. Let's start, let's see what we have here. Okay, here's an audience question. I've just started dating someone with young onset PD, diagnosed four years ago. He spends a lot of time checking in to be sure I know that I'm in for the, what I'm in for, for in the future. How can I best support him and help him understand that he may have PD, but he is not PD? Dr. Fleischer, did you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Um, so when I, when I hear that question, I hear that that person with PD is anxiety just ringing out so loud in that the needing to, you know, to keep checking in and say, do you know about this? Do you know about this? Do you know, you know, do you know what's going to happen? Um, to me, that sounds like someone who's, whose anxiety about the future, you know, really needs to be addressed. And so, um, there are all kinds and, I, and I'm not a therapist, um, but, um, you know, ways to deal with that anxiety. So helping connect, um, the person that she's dating, you know, saying maybe it would be helpful to talk with someone about this, because it sounds like, you, you know, you're really concerned about what the future might bring, but I want to be with you in the present. Maybe it would be helpful mm -hmm. to connect with someone who can help talk about that, but I really want to be with you in the present. And sometimes setting limits. So um, as a mom of a kid with anxiety, what I've been taught is um, sort of the, you know, couple question rule, which is we're only going to talk about this. All right. Well, you know, you've asked, you've asked that question two times today. We're not going to talk about that question anymore today. We're going to talk about it tomorrow. What do we want to talk about instead? Um, yeah. right. And kind of using that to reframe, um, you know, I'm here with you in this moment. I'm here for you. Let's focus on now. Great. Great. If anybody else has, uh, answered to add to that, just, okay, great. I know we're all, we're all dealing with a level of anxiety right now. And I also have a child who has some anxiety. And so there are so many tools available and people are so much more aware about it. And there are so many great ways to, to kind of address that. And, and I love that you picked up on that right away, that that's kind of, that's probably what's going on. So wonderful. Um, okay. Another audience question. I'm going to pose this one to Rich. Uh, how do you encourage without being a nag? <laughs> That's that <laughs> fine line all of us are trying to, to walk, right? Of, I want to be positive and supportive, but I also don't want to become irritating. <laughs> and I well, want to encourage them to do things, especially when they're feeling apathetic, 
um, encourage yeah. them to keep exercising, kind of move through that. But how do you do that without becoming annoying? Yeah, I, I can't help being annoying. It's just who I am. I just have to. <laughs> um, so my my um, my approach to that, which uh, you know works for us, hope it works for everyone else. You know, on the subject of exercise, for instance. We saw Paula has been an exerciser, always exercise, so that was not something she needed convincing to do. But a few weeks ago, we watched a webinar about kind of this current state of research on exercise and Parkinson's. She watched it with me. It was just incredibly positive, incredibly optimistic that exercise really can slow down progression. So my approach is to kind of bring that into the conversation. Take a look at this. Look at what this can do for us. You know, if there's something about what, what diet can potentially do, as opposed to it just coming from me saying, you know, oh, gee, you should try to eat this or you should try to do this kind of exercise, um, bringing in someone that's actually an expert as opposed to me. So that, right. that's my, my approach. Yeah, I, I found, and this is something that I learned pretty quickly in our marriage, that <clears throat> Larry won't do anything unless it's his own idea. So he like me encouraging him to do something, he'll file it away and he'll note it and he won't discourage me from encouraging, but he won't necessarily do it until he's absolutely ready to do it. And so I like the bringing in the third party and just kind of, hey, if you watched this documentary, have you read this article and just kind of, you know, giving him the information he needs so he can make his own decision rather than trying to steer him a certain direction, right? Exactly. Because ultimately, it's, it's, it's their decision. They have to buy into it. Right. Yeah, they have to want to be well, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Maggie or Dr. Fleischer, do you have anything to add to that? My dad would tell you I know nothing about that. Uh, <laughs> nothing about not being able to nag. So, nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Fleischer, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, I've certainly been accused of nagging family members who have different health issues, but um, one thing that we've found helpful is humor um, and also sometimes having like a shorthand. So, um, you know, during, during a, a heated time when I was trying to convince someone to do something that, you know, they knew they should do, I said, it's coming from a place of love. And I got back this like place of love, place of love. Um, and now, you know, if I suggest something, I literally just go like place of love. Um, and, you know, it's almost a shorthand for this is going to annoy you, but I can't. Um, and so, you know, having that, I have a, a partner, um, a care partner who her husband was getting really frustrated with um, constantly being reminded to fix his posture. Um, and so they came up with this shorthand where she tells him to boing it and just kind of thrust his pelvis forward. And so it's hilarious. And it just makes both of them laugh. It makes me laugh. But, you know, they're walking along and he, he might get more stooped and she just goes, boing it. And boing. it works. And it's not nagging. You know, it's become this this thing for them. So, you know, not that that works in every situation, but I think if you can find the little, you know, a little bit of humor, it goes such a long way. Laughter is a great healer and a great equalizer, right? And it's a great way to communicate even some of those dark, regarding some of those dark things or worrisome things. Like, I really want you to take care of yourself. And, but, you know, sometimes people can hear it better when it comes through from a place of amusement and humor. Great. Okay, another audience cue. As a person with Parkinson's, I am feeling more and more guilty about having to rely on others. So how does one deal with this? Um, Maggie, just raise your hand. Anybody who wants to, to answer, you can raise your hand. Maggie, do you have any perspective on that? Sure. Um, I mean, I feel this a lot in my normal life. I don't like to ask being, uh, people for things. So I could see how you would feel this way if you're somebody who is dealing with Parkinson's diagnosis. Um, I would say that for me personally, I like to feel needed. And I'm sure that if you are a Parkinson's patient, there are people in your life who feel the same way. So although it may seem to you like you're a burden to them, they probably like to have tangible ways to help you. And it makes them feel involved. It makes them feel like they're a part of it. And they're actually doing something to help. 
oftentimes as as people in your in in the circle of someone who has Parkinson's, we feel like we can't really do anything. Um, we just kind of have to sit there and 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 not really take an active part. So. For me, when anything that I can do to help always always makes me feel better. So I would say, hopefully, that would assuage some guilt. But I'm sure that I'm sure that that's a constant battle. It's hard to ask for help, right? So I I identify with what this with what this person is asking, and especially if you're feeling vulnerable, or <clears throat> you have a new issue that's come up that you that you don't really want to talk about, but that you need some help with, and and asking for that help can be a really really hard step. So I get it. Richard, Dr. Fleischer, do you have any anything to add? I think flipping no, the script I mean, and imagining if someone else, you know, needed that help and, and asked you or if you thought that they needed that help, you know, most people would say, oh my God, I would jump to do that. Um, and recognizing that that's, that's how others may feel. So having a little bit of that sort of self-compassion to say, I would do this for someone else. Someone else probably wants to do this for me while simultaneously reframing and recognizing how many things you can do, right? So it might be that you need help for A or B, but there's so much else that you can do. So I think holding those two things together is important. Yeah. Rich, I think you wanted to chime in. Yeah, I, I was just gonna add that, um, I, I know that Paula doesn't like to ask for help. So even little things like if I'm going to the to the grocery store, which is not exactly something that I actually like look forward to do. I'm not very good at it, to be honest with you. Um, Paula wants to come along, but you know what? There, there might be some times a day that the, the walking might make it difficult. So we just pick a time that, that works and that way she doesn't feel like she's imposing upon me that I have to be the one doing shopping. So it's just little things like that. Well, and I think like several of you have said, it's. I think they might be really surprised of how much people want to help and maybe they don't know how to and they're waiting for you to ask. And so if just, just posing that question and having that conversation, like you said, Rich, about what negotiating, what can, what is helpful and what can she do, right? And yep. yeah. Can I add something really quick on that? Sure. Um, I, I have learned um, that a lot of times there's stuff that's happening that me or my mom or my sister, we just don't really know what's, what's happening because um, obviously we can't get inside of dad's brain. Um, it's really helped me to read things that are written by people who are living with Parkinson's, specifically like Michael J. Fox's books are great, um, also because he's really funny. Um, but there's other things that you can read and resources and understanding symptoms that other people are having helps you know what to ask for. So I think I read through... Um, MJF's most recent book, and he was describing some sort of symptom that he usually has that I had never even heard of. And I asked my dad about it, and he said, oh, yeah, that happens to me sometimes. So we never would have known to ask for that. We never would have known how to help him with that um, if, if I wasn't kind of understanding what other people go through. So it gives you a really interesting perspective and, and to kind of know what to ask for. Well, and that speaks to the power of us sharing our stories. And when we're willing to kind of talk about our experiences as people with Parkinson's and care partners, things like that, you would have never known unless somebody had been willing to be vulnerable and share that, right? And that's just even one very small example of all the power that you can have when we're, when we're all willing to share our stories. So great, thanks for, thank you for bringing that up. That's fantastic. <clears throat> okay, another question. How can I make visits more enjoyable for me and my husband who is in a memory care facility? Dr. Fleischer, do you wanna take that one? Sure, I mean, I think this is such a challenge right now, especially with COVID because I don't know what um, restrictions might be in place. Um, so if, you know, if you're able to meet um, but just meet outside, you know, is it possible to go for a walk? Is it possible to find a bench, you know, to sit outside and, you know, enjoy the scenery, enjoy the weather, or, you know, play a game, talk about something, reminisce about, you know, a trip, something else, you know, that that, that setting reminds you of. Um, if you're able, you know, to be indoors together, I think coming with, you know, a, a loose list, it doesn't have to be followed, but, you know, maybe some ideas of activities. So, can you bring a puzzle? Can you bring a book of jokes? Can you bring an audio book to listen to together? Um, it can be so isolating to be in a memory care facility. Um, you know, so, so 
bringing something so that it doesn't just have to be, I show up and what do we talk about? You know, maybe we talk about what did you eat for lunch? And, you know, that answer is probably not going to be super positive. Um, you know, coming with some simple ideas, bringing a photo album, you know, looking through those kind of things. Um, I, I think all of those are really helpful and talk to the people at the facility. So sometimes there are activity planners and classes and things like that. And your loved one may or may not want to go to those things, but knowing what's available, um, you know, sometimes there might be apathy. So kind of saying, Hey, I heard that there's a, you know, movie night that's coming up tomorrow. You know, what do you think about going to that? Um, I think often there are a lot of resources at memory care facilities that we might not be aware of. Okay. Great. Rich, did you, I want to give you an opportunity to chime in. You, I believe you had a parent in a memory unit, You both both you and Pola? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I did. My, my dad was in a memory care unit, and um, it, uh, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. it. It's tough because he wasn't actually sure who I was. I could have been a brother. I could have been a nephew, but I was a familiar face. Um, I, I will tell you that I did, I, I would bring our dog along, who, who is a, therapy dog. The other residents, you know, love seeing the dog. And my dad loves seeing the dog. You know, that helped. But it, it, it's tough because you, you bring a, a photo album. I found an old photo album of my dad in the Army, and this was from Italy in 1945, and he thought it was me. So it was, you know, it's, it's, it's really mm -hmm. challenging. The only thing that kind of uh, got me through it to some extent was, was the, this thought that um, my dad, my dad's soul, what he was as a person, as a dad, as, as a, you know, as a husband, that had kind of slowly slipped away. And it was kind of just kind of the shell that was remaining. So that I, I use that as a way of not, you know, trying not to be as upset that he couldn't remember the things that, you know, I, I wanted him to remember that he, you know, he couldn't remember my, my mom who had passed away a couple of years before. Um, that you couldn't have those kinds of conversations. So I would go there. I feel good about going there because he was happy to see me. Um, and from that perspective, I thought that I was was doing good. But you know, it's it's not it, it's not easy in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. We have another question that um, perhaps us care partners can answer. What about feeling isolated or lonely as a care partner, especially if a person needs a lot of assistance? Well, and Dr. Fleischman, I'm sure you have you have uh, some perspective on that as well. That sense of isolation, and it's only gotten worse with COVID, right? Um, what's a um, what? Is, they're just asking the general question. What would you What would you say to them? So maybe you have some advice or wisdom to offer. I'll start with Dr. Fleischman. Oh, sure. So, I mean, I would say, um, as strange as it sounds, you're not alone in your loneliness, right? Um, that, that this is so common and rampant. And, and even pre-COVID, um, the United Kingdom has a minister of loneliness, um, recognizing that this is such a, a huge and growing issue. Um, so, you know, strategies that can be helpful, um, finding a support group, um, tapping into the Parkinson's Buddy Network. Um, my research team, for example, we're working on studies to build caregiver, peer, or care partner, peer mentors, connecting someone who's um, experienced um, with someone who maybe is newer on their journey as a, a partner in Parkinson's. Um, and so, you know, tapping into those things, if you don't know how to access those things, the Fox Foundation is a great, you know, source. Um, reaching out to your movement disorder specialist, your neurologist, you know, saying, I need a team. I need more strategies. I need more connection. What's out there? Because there's a tremendous amount out there, but it can be really overwhelming to navigate. So I'd be really interested in, in Maggie and Rich's perspective. Um, yeah, for, uh, quickly for about 30 seconds, because we're going to need to wrap up here. If either of you has any perspective on that. I would just say to ask for help um, as a care partner. That was another question that somebody had asked about um, how do you widen your circle? Um, just ask. People don't know that you need help if you don't ask them. Great. On that note, we're going to wrap up. We are out of time. This was what a great conversation. Thank you so much to our panelists. 
for being here and thank you for everybody in the viewing audience for being here. It was such a pleasure. Um, thank you again for being part of our community and for joining us today. And thanks to our panelists for sharing your time and expertise. We'll be sending a link to the webinar on demand to listen again or share as you'd like. And we hope you found it helpful. We had such a, a it was such a pleasure to do it with you. Have a great day.